Hello and good evening, afternoon, morning, or wherever you are. Welcome at a new hashtag Ask Wartel livestream. My name is Frans Oudendorp and I'm a lead consultant security at Wartel. And tonight we will talk about everything related Windows Virtual Desktop. Together with my colleagues, Freek Besson and Marcel Aiken, we will discuss WVD and our experiences from the field. How automation can be done and we discuss the new features that are announced at the last Ignite conference. But first, let's introduce our guest. Freik, can you introduce yourself for the people that don't know who you are? Yeah, sure. So my name is Freik Bersel. I uh, Within Wartel, I primarily focus on anything that's related to application and desktop delivery using remoting technology. So things like RDS, VDI, uh, remote app, and Windows Virtual Desktop as well mostly on the Azure uh, platform uh, today. And I enjoy doing that both from an architectural standpoint as well as uh, diving deep into the technology. I've been in this space for many years, uh, part of the MVP program uh, as well. And uh, happy to be here today to share some of our knowledge uh, today. So uh, thank you for having us, uh, Frans. Good to have you in our live stream. So uh, good to, uh, to be part of this. And we have also Marcel, uh, Marcel Aiken, um, our colleague. Uh, Marcel, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, sure, Franz. Thanks for having uh, for having me as well. I'm really delighted to to uh, deliver in this show. Um, my uh, role within Wartel is also uh, an infrastructure architect with a premier focus on virtualization, uh, remote desktop services, and uh, uh, Windows Virtual Desktop uh, in the last, uh, well, basically 12 months, uh, uh, the focus is really high on WVD. So that's a really interesting scenario. Yeah, and besides our technical fellows, we have also Maurice uh, within this live stream. Uh, Maurice is uh, here for the social questions that can be sent to hashtag Ask Hotel. Maurice, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course, friends. Hi, I'm Maurice. Tonight I will hand over the questions uh, that you can send uh, using the, in the hashtag AskWartel, and I will send them right back to you guys so uh, we can have a good night. And um, after this, I also will have a raffle, and uh, there will be we will be sending out some uh, goodie bags for you guys and for our viewers with a great question. So I, we have some uh, some goodies that can be sent out to uh, the ones that uh, deliver the questions to uh, to us. Um, but this live stream is all about Windows Virtual Desktop. Marcel, I, I will start with you. For the people who are not familiar with uh, WVD, what is it? What is it in a nutshell? Uh, well, um, I expect most of us are familiar with terminal services and remote desktop services. Uh, in remote desktop services, if it's on-prem or even in the cloud, you still need uh, virtual machines or machines for basically every role you have in your environment. Uh, also for the back-end roles. So uh, roles like a session broker, connection broker, licensing, load balancing, a gateway, all those particular roles uh, need a virtual machine. Uh, in WVD or Windows Virtual Desktop, uh, it's a platform as a service solution now, and basically the whole backplane is now uh, in a service uh, hosted by Microsoft, not running on your uh, Azure environment, but in an environment uh, with Microsoft, and you don't need to uh, manage that, that environment as well. So uh, the only things uh, that are part of your WVD environment that you still need to manage and you will uh, see in your environment are the session hosts. So if you look a little deep architecture, um, you will actually see that. So uh, on, on one hand, you see the, the, the part managed by Microsoft. In the bottom, you see the Azure infrastructure. So there you see the compute part, 
storage and networking. That's all what you need uh, in an environment, in an infrastructure environment. Uh, on top of that, you see the actual uh, Windows Virtual Desktop control plane or the back plane uh, that's being managed by Microsoft and running in their environment. So it's running the broker, the gateway, load balancing, and next and managing the environment. But next to that, also uh, some new uh, roles that actually uh, uh, make use of the environment of Azure itself, uh, Azure uh, Log Analytics, and also Azure Monitor to keep control and keep track of your environment and the health of your environment. On the other side, you see the parts that are still within your environment. So you need an, uh, an identity uh, part. So uh, a synchronization of Active Directory into Azure Active Directory. Uh, and on top of that, and of course, your security, et cetera. And on top of that, you actually run your session hosts where we have multiple options that can be used within the WVD environment. So we have uh, the older like remote desktop services session host based on the uh, server OSs. And those are supported from server 2012 R2 and up. And uh, next to that, of course, Windows 10, there was also already uh, a solution that was available as a VDI solution. Uh, next to that, Windows 7 is still supported in the environment as well and in Azure as a VDI solution for single users. And on top of that, we have a new Windows 10 multi-session solution uh, that is uh, capable of running session as a session host, making it uh, available uh, a full desktop experience similar to your laptop running now on the session host platform and running multiple users. And uh, Marcel, question uh, regarding WVD. Um, what is it uh, comparing to uh, Citrix or VMware? Can you explain a little bit about it? Yes, definitely. Um, of course, WVD is a full native solution. So you don't uh, need extra additional parts. And in uh, some scenarios, that's that's sufficient for an environment. Um, you have a full a Microsoft solution in that. And uh, it's it being uh, paid on your M365 license. Um, Frank, do you maybe have something to add to that on that solution? Yeah, for sure. So what we see is, like you mentioned, is that Windows Virtual Desktop itself, it's a native solution, uh, like the diagram is showing uh, us just now, uh, based on Microsoft uh, technology. Uh, but on top of that, uh, Microsoft has defined many uh, what they call ecosystem partners, which uh, actually add value on top of the Windows Virtual Desktop platform. So think about things like uh, added functionality for uh, to optimize printing or to optimize the management or the image uh, management or you know, other stuff that are uh, that is important for the Windows Virtual Desktop uh, deployment. And there are a couple of other um, uh, ecosystem partners who stand out in a way that they're not so much adding value on top of Windows Virtual Desktop, but have their own uh, backplane, as we saw in the diagram. So these are, of course, uh, the Citrix uh, and the VMwares of this world. Who, have, who are delivering their own backplane in Azure as well. Uh, but what makes them a WVD partner is the fact that they can also leverage Windows 10 multi-session as the new operating system uh, because they are running uh, in Azure. So yeah, like you said, uh, for many use cases, uh, it's Windows Virtual Desktop can be uh, sufficient depending on the use case and depending on your application landscape. Uh, for some scenarios, you might want to add additional tools that add additional value on top of uh, the, um, the solution or you can refer to other partners uh, who, uh, well, basically replace that backplane with uh, with other functionality uh, as well. Yeah, Frank, you're already uh, mentioning uh, use cases. Uh, Marcel, a question for you: uh, What are typical use cases that can uh, that, that we see for a WVD, and how are customers leveraging this service? Yeah, that's a good question uh, that we run into in our daily job, uh, basically every day. Um, of course, today, the modern workplace is a laptop and, and more and more applications are actually moving towards being a web applica application or a SaaS, a SaaS solution. Uh, but some applications are either not at that point yet or uh, maybe are depending too much on a backend. Um, typical client server applications. Um, basically applications that require uh, GPU solutions or uh, solutions where an application 
uh, and some data you want to keep within your managed environment. Uh, in that place, place um, WVD comes in very useful as a remote app platform. So within your environment, you uh, make a client server application available by publishing the app into that modern workplace or into, into your uh, Windows 10 workplace, uh, publishing it within the start menu. So for an end user, it's not really noticeable that it's an application not running on their actual laptop, but uh, in the background in the cloud. Uh, that's one scenario. Another scenario is a full desktop scenario. For instance, uh, think of that you have contractors in your environment or uh, developers that uh, depend on uh, a full desktop. You have maybe a bring your own device uh, solution or you don't want to hand over expensive managed laptops to a contractor, but you can still give them a full desktop that's being managed from within your own environment running uh, in the public cloud. And that's on WVD. Uh, a third solution, I already mentioned developers or maybe other use cases or users that depend on high graphical power. You can actually buy or uh, uh, hand over a, a cheaper laptop or at least a less expensive laptop and uh, still give them the full GPU power, but from within the WVD environment from Azure. So those are typical use cases. and. Think of a Think Client solution as well. That's also a use case where you actually have a quite, uh, uh, well, scaled down device, uh, flexible device being used by multiple users, and they are still connecting to their own uh, environment, having their own profile within a managed environment. Those are typical use cases for WVD. Yeah, thank you for explaining, uh, Marcel, what uh, WVD is and how we can use it. And I think later on this show, uh, we will show also in some demos um, some use cases uh, that you already explained. Um, if we look at the social questions that uh, you can um, you can ask with the hashtag Ask or Tell, uh, Maurice, do we have questions already from uh, our audience? Or uh, if not, maybe you have a question for one of our uh, uh, technical fellows in this show. Yeah, people are a bit shy uh, tonight, I think. Um, so uh, I will have a question. Um, if you if you have an organization that's already uh, running uh, uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, um, well, what is considered the classic release now, uh, how would you migrate until uh, un into the latest release? Um, I'm curious about that. I think, uh, Freik, that's a nice question for you. Can you can you answer that one? Yeah, sure. Happy to answer that. I think that's a very common question we see uh, today because many organizations that started using Windows Virtual Desktop started using what you refer to as the classic uh, release, so the early release of Windows Virtual Desktop. And so uh, there are a lot of benefits, as we'll see later on in this uh, session as well, in terms of uh, the new session uh, the new Windows uh, Virtual Desktop environment based on Spring and based on ARM uh, release. Uh, but in terms of migration, uh, Microsoft is working on a PowerShell script, a PowerShell command within their PowerShell module that allows you to migrate your entire host pool, including virtual machines, including your configuration from uh, the classic release towards the new Windows Virtual Desktop release based on Spring and based on the ARM uh, components. Uh, but that's not available right now. So if you want to migrate uh, right now, you have a couple of options depending on uh, which application landscape method you use and how you're dealing with your application landscape and your golden images. For example, if you have a golden image strategy where you created your golden image and you deployed your existing host pool based on that golden image, uh, you can leverage that same template and simply create a new WVD deployment within ARM uh, based on that same template image and then migrate your users over once you have tested and completed uh, that configuration in there. Another thing, if you are uh, if you don't have that golden image approach, but you are rather managing the virtual machines that you have deployed as part of the host pool, uh, you can also migrate those virtual machines from uh, the existing host pool to the new one uh, using PowerShell. I think we also have a demo later on that actually show you uh, how to uh, how to do that. So. For now, it's it's uh, some sort of a manual task, and we will show you some automation uh, for that. But long term, Microsoft is coming out with a PowerShell 
uh, commandlet to automate all of those steps uh, for you. That is good to hear. Uh, Maurice, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, very nice. Uh, but I have an uh, additional question. Uh, what do you advise, Freik? Uh, should I uh, migrate now? Yeah, uh, if it were me, uh, definitely, because if you take a look at uh, the feature set of the spring release, uh, the fact that it's based on ARM and based on uh, all of the new components uh, in, that, uh, in that ARM release, there are so many benefits in terms of uh, functionality and stability and uh, management. Uh, so definitely worth uh, uh, migrating right now um, and not waiting for, uh, for the PowerShell commandlet to come out. Okay, thank you. Um, Maurice, is that, is that all? Or, yeah, that's it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, Freik, uh, you already mentioned uh, automation. Automation is key uh, for every Azure service. Uh, how can we leverage automation for WVD? Yeah, great question. And I could not agree with you more uh, in terms of when you're uh, doing a deployment in Azure, or, or this basically applies to other uh, public clouds uh, as well, uh, being successful is all about embracing uh, automation in one way or another. So going back to the classic release that was mentioned uh, before, we didn't really have much automation options in that uh, release. So we didn't have the integration into Azure Resource Manager. The PowerShell module was a separate module you needed to download and install uh, to be able to use it. And REST API wasn't really uh, available uh, for uh, the majority of uh, people. So with the transition from the classic release to the new Windows Virtual Desktop uh, release, that all changed. So we now have a broad priority of different <laughs> ways to be able to do automation uh, for Windows Virtual Desktop. So whether your favorite tool is uh, using PowerShell, or if you are a fan of REST API, or if you would rather uh, author uh, JSON templates as part of your ARM deployment and DevOps uh, automation. That is all uh, available uh, today. So let me actually show you uh, a couple of demos to, uh, to give an idea of uh, what automation can do for you for, uh, for Windows Virtual Desktop. So um, I'm going to share my screen now. And here we're looking at the, uh, at the Azure portal. I'm looking into uh, a, a resource group. Which is, uh, which is currently empty, right? They can refresh this. There are no options, I'm sorry, no objects available in this uh, resource group. And let's now leverage, uh, first of all, REST API to create uh, a Windows Virtual Desktop environment uh, using an automated way. <laughs> so what I have here is uh, a script. And uh, this script is uh, a demo script that contains uh, functions to be able to uh, get all of my work subbases, host pools, and app groups, uh, but also create new ones. So it contains functions for you to leverage and uh, start using them. So I'm not going to cover the entire script, but let's just uh, kick it off to see uh, what it does. So let me uh, run these, uh, these variables in order to create uh, the tokens and the headers that we need for, uh, for REST API. And let's now uh, simply create all of these objects in our Azure portal. So as you can see, the command actually fails, which is interesting. Um, as you can see, this is a live demo. So while it's we fix always, this, uh, yeah, go it's ahead. It's always the same with live demos. It is. <clears throat> let me just uh, let me just skip this uh, part for now. I'm I'm not going to dive into it in the, during the live uh, during the live session. But the idea of this uh, script is that we are creating the objects in the uh, in the Azure portal. So going back to the Azure portal. We would now create uh, a host pool, an app group, and a um, and a workspace uh, ready to use uh, for Windows uh, Virtual Desktop. So that's one way of dealing with uh, with automation for Windows Virtual Desktop is leveraging that REST API uh, functionality. The second thing I want to show you is uh, is PowerShell. So we are now looking at a different host pool. This is a host pool that was already pre-created, uh, uh, which does not contain any session host service. So we can refresh this. And there are no session host servers currently available in this desktop host pool. So we're now leveraging something else, uh, PowerShell. So this is a PowerShell script which automates the steps to be able to add a uh, virtual machine into an existing uh, host pool. So let's go ahead and run that right now. Let's see if this demo actually completes. 
So the step that this uh, template, uh, this uh, PowerShell script does is it downloads the uh, WVD agent, it downloads the side-by-side -side stack agent uh, as well. It checks if there is an existing um, key that is uh, part of this host pool. If so, it will reuse that key. And if not, it will generate a new one that it needs to be able to add itself to uh, the session host. So in a couple of uh, seconds, uh, that process is now uh, complete um, and ready. Uh, and this means that session host server is now part of that host pool. So uh, while we wait for that complete, what are some of the uh, scenarios that you could leverage the script uh, for? You might be, as we said before, migrating your session host service from a previous release towards uh, Spring. You can leverage the script to automate the steps of joining a virtual machine towards uh, a host pool. Uh, or you might have done a uh, WD deployment based on the Azure portal, uh, and you have deployed 20 servers, and one of them failed for whatever reason. You can go into the virtual machine, launch that script from the virtual machine, and have it add itself to um, the host pool. So let's go back into the Azure portal hit refresh, and we now have that session host server available, which is ready uh, for use. So again, second method of using automation uh, based on PowerShell. And the last example I want to show you is uh, using Azure Resource Manager templates or ARM templates. So obviously, if you're deploying Windows Virtual Desktop, we now have the option based on a spring release to be able to deploy host pools from within the Azure portal uh, allowing me to select the values and just uh, create the host pool and create the virtual machines uh, from this uh, marketplace entry. Uh, you can, however, also use custom ARM templates. And one of some of the reasons for that is that you have full control over what is taking place as part of this deployment. So you might have specific naming conventions for your network adapters or uh, managed disks or other or properties that are part of your host pool. You have full control uh, if you're using a custom ARM template. To give you an idea of what that looks like, this is an ARM template that we have created uh, before and uploaded to the Azure portal as part of, an, uh, part of a template object uh, in the Azure portal. And if I deploy it, you can see that I have a couple of options that are similar to the options we just saw in the Azure portal. So I can able to specify um, the VNet, the subnet, the workspace name, uh, et cetera. But since this is a custom template, I also have the option to, do, uh, to create these nice drop-down boxes for the administrator so that he can just pick and choose which workspace, which host pool, uh, and which um, application groups I'm using uh, for this deployment. Also, for example, it's easy to select the organizational unit, so I do not have to copy and paste that distinguished name from my active directory back into this field. I can just select the organizational unit of where I want to uh, deploy this. Uh, I can specify the number of which machines, the sizing, uh, and all of that. So this is a custom ARM template which uh, deploys X number of virtual machines. So based on the number that I specify here, I can add one or I can add 100 if I wanted to. It will create all of those virtual machines inside the Azure portal, join into the domain, and also add them to the host pool. Uh, in about 10 minutes, that completes, depending, of course, on the size of your template and the number of VMs you are uh, deploying. So if you are familiar with, uh, yeah. with ARM templates, uh, you might know that, yes, it's very powerful to use ARM templates. And yes, it allows you to do a lot of automation by using that declarative uh, JSON language. But the downside of JSON is that sometimes it can be uh, a little bit complex. So I'm not sure if you, Frans, have, uh, are you experienced, uh, are you an experienced ARM author, uh, so to speak? Do you have experience with Azure Resource Manager JSON code? Um, not directly with Azure Resource Manager, but uh, other um, uh, scripting tools like PowerShell and the REST API uh, are, are more and more used. Um, also within uh, other uh, security tools that we are using uh, normally today. But um, I, what I see in in this uh, with these demos, there are multiple ways uh, to automate uh, the Windows Virtual Desktop deployments and and see how that can be uh, can be done. Uh, within an environment, and I think uh, maybe you can um, uh, help us with that. Uh, I think that th there will be a few next steps uh, within uh, automation from uh, also from the portal, and uh, maybe maybe you can explain that a little. Bit. Yeah, sure. So um, if you're looking at the, the JSON language itself, like I said, it's a very uh, it is a markup language, so it should be an XML style the document, but it can be very complex in terms of. Uh, all of the syntax that I need. Uh, so semicolons and colons and, and brackets and all of that. Uh, but we have a new uh, technology that is uh, currently into preview. 
which is uh, the BICEP language. Uh, if you're familiar with that, it was announced a couple of weeks uh, ago. And it's basically, it's a, a descriptive language on top of your JSON template. So in this diagram right now, we're looking at uh, the ARM, uh, the Azure Resource Manager environment with ARM templates on top. And BICEP is able to provide you those JSON uh, templates. So without authoring any JSON code, without going into that syntax, we are able to create those JSON templates by using what's called the BICEP language. So a quick demo before we uh, move on is that uh, I have a sample BICEP file right here. And as you can see, if you are familiar with ARM code, this looks pretty clean. Uh, there are not, met, met, not that many uh, syntaxes uh, need to in order to create uh, parameters, create variables, uh, et cetera. So if I uh, would create a uh, JSON file from this deployment, let me just uh, do that by selecting, um, I'm sorry, by entering this. Let me just rephrase it. So within uh, one commandlet, we are able to build that deployment uh, based on the BICEP file. So now what I have available is a JSON template. So as you can see, this looks much more complex than the uh, 40 lines we had before. We now have 75 lines of JSON code. Uh, it's much more complex, but it uh, does the same thing. Uh, another great example is also when you take a look at uh, specific things like, for example, pointing to the host pool uh, ID in this case, we can have that uh, very short notation called hp.id. So I'm referring to the host pool and the resource ID in here. If I would compare that towards uh, a JSON language, this is why I would need to type into a JSON uh, command. But so just a couple of quick examples to show you what the power is of, uh, of BICEP, allowing you to create those JSON templates uh, for the Azure portal without having to have knowledge about, uh, about JSON, about uh, the language uh, itself. And it's interesting to see that Microsoft recently also uh, made available that uh, what they see is that 70% of the, the resources that are being created in the Azure portal are actually still based on the cloud method using, uh, using templates. So definitely a great, uh, a great new tool uh, for, the, uh, for the ARM developer, uh, for Windows with your desktop, but also for other technologies within, uh, within the Azure portal. Yeah, great, great to see uh, all the enhancements that are done uh, from an automation perspective, because I have many questions that I had at customers regarding WVD was the, the lack of automation and uh, what we see in these demos, uh, more and more is coming. Uh, but uh, with this automation, we um, we are seeing only host pools that uh, can be delivered. And there can also be a golden image uh, and, and, and others. But um, the application landscape, um, what is that, um, Marcel? Maybe, uh, can you elaborate some more on how applic the application landscape can be managed uh, on top of uh, the host pools that are enrolled with the automation Frank explained already? Um, maybe yeah. you can help us with that. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, if we if we look at uh, an environment, um, traditionally we had personal devices, and within personal devices, you used uh, a lot of companies used, uh, for instance, configuration manager uh, to manage those devices or third-party equivalents to that. Uh, and for personal machines, that's still applicable also for a virtual machine, because basically that personal personal machine within a virtual environment is still a normal personal VM. Uh, if we look at uh, pooled VMs, or sorry, pooled uh, session hosts, uh, consistent, consistently, sorry, consistently uh, across the environment, it's much more important. And that's where uh, a source image or a so-called golden image comes in uh, good. So what we, what we do at that scenario is that we basically uh, create a template machine and uh, deploy the applications that are needed within the environment on that application, the template machine. And uh, based on the template machine, we capture an image. And that image particularly is being used as a source image. And uh, Frake showed us the ARM templates to deploy a host pool. Uh, one of the uh, variables within that uh, template is that uh, pointing to that source image and uh, giving you that source image as uh, yeah as the, the the start of an environment 
Um, that's what we how we do it today. Um, very often, uh, either build that uh, build that uh, machine with applications coming from uh, the traditional uh, configuration manager environment, uh, and then capture it, or basically create a, a template machine. Uh, and make it a single source uh, file to to build that environment. Um, and Microsoft is actually having uh, a solution to that that's coming. It's still in preview. That's Azure Image Builder, and that helps uh, building up that environment to um, um, uh, building that environment to. Um, even easier so uh, it's it's an automated process uh, that uh, where you have your source file uh, your source image and you can do customizations on that source image from within the image builder solution and uh, easily create an updated uh, source image from image builder and deploy that automatically again across your host pools uh, that you pointed to um, yeah, Marcel, you talked about uh, personal uh, machines, which you can manage with uh, SCCM uh, MEM, uh, what we call uh, what we cover later on, uh, but also mm -hmm. Golden Image uh, Image Builder, which is coming. Um, but uh, other vendors, but also Microsoft is uh, using application virtualization. And I think um, regarding uh, MSIX, uh, that's the new, uh, a new one in, uh, in in the package that was uh, already announced last year. Uh, but I think there were uh, this year there were announced announcements GA for I think um, what is it? What is MSIX and how can we do that uh, within the application landscape? Yes, yes, a very good question. MSEX is definitely uh, uh, available and making it a lot easier uh, to, uh, to to make applications available to users. It's not for every application. It depends a little. Similar to in the past with AppV, AU and uh, MSIX that came after it. Um, you had applications that are applicable for MSIX uh, and some are not. But if you look at that, that's a solution that's also uh, making use of newer technologies, making use of uh, the speed that we have nowadays in the networking. Um, so what we're building in this scenario, and I'll do a quick demo um, in a minute, uh, is that we create uh, a virtual hard disk, a VSDX file, and install the application into that file and make it available by mounting that file into a session or to a machine. And that's an instant process. So if I switch over to my demo machine, um, you should be able to see that now. And um, yeah, if we look at that machine, uh, I look at the start menu and I take as an example, Notepad++. We don't see that installed in this machine. So we see Notepad, but we don't see Notepad++ available for me as a user. Um, I mentioned the VHDX file. Um, we have a share on the network that holds a particular Notepad VHDX file that we prepared uh, prior to the session. And if I um, run some uh, PowerShell scripts, I stage that uh, VHDX to my machine. So if I look at Device Manager now, you see uh, my OS disk, you see the temporary disk that comes from Azure, and I um, I don't have an extra disk available. If I run that staging process, then we look back at the environment, we see we have an extra disk added to the environment. And now we run some extra PowerShell to just register the application that's actually running on that particular VHDX that's available on there. And if we now go back to the start menu and do Notepad, we see Notepad++ available just in an instant. Double click it, and it runs like it's locally installed. Um, and similar process to what I just showed. Um, I do a deregister, so I basically take it off uh, from the machine with deregistering the application, and destage it afterwards, and then you will see that in the device manager, the disk is gone again. 
And you know, start menu, if I go back to Notepad, it's like before. So it's not available anymore. And that's a really quick tool to make applications available to specific users or to groups of users. So that's definitely something uh, that's here now and that will be used uh, very often, I expect, in the near future. Yeah, great to see that enhancements that are being made in the in the landscape. Um, Maurice, uh, maybe uh, you can help us. Uh, and if there are any social questions uh, already done uh, with, from the audience. Yeah, we've got uh, one question sent in from uh, YouTube. It's from uh, Ralph K. And he asks if uh, something about security, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> How does uh, virtual, Windows Virtual, uh, what? I lost it. Uh, how, do, how can we handle like security, like ne network security? Um, I will tell you, uh, Freik, maybe you can help us uh, on that question. Sure, yeah, so uh, obviously uh, security is a big part of the Windows Virtual Desktop service uh, itself. Uh, and a big part, a big uh, plus for uh, comparing it to traditional uh, deployments like RDS or uh, on-prem uh, deployments. We are now basing uh, authentication, which is one of the first things you were into for a WD service in terms of security, is based on Azure AD, which means that we can instantly leverage things like uh, conditional access and MFA on to, and uh, all of the Azure AD functions that are uh, helping us secure that uh, environment. That's on the uh, front side, uh, of course. Uh, and then this, for the security on site, uh, this side of VM, it basically all comes down to security, uh, well, how we are dealing security right now. So in the end, what the Windows the Desktop Service does, besides all of the components that are part of the platform as a service model, we're creating virtual machines. And we're creating those virtual machines in the inside of VNet and inside of subnet that you uh, uh, point out to and that you select. So uh, at that point, you just have a virtual machine that you can add uh, firewall rules on top of it, on side, inside, I'm sorry, on, uh, on the VM itself. But also, of course, the, as part of what they refer to right now, is security to other parts. So using uh, network security groups and making sure that from that virtual machine, the user is not able to access anything that you don't want. Uh, that's basically done by existing Azure technology because the virtual machines, that, those are just IaaS uh, virtual machines like any other IS uh, machine uh, in Azure. OK, thank you for that answer, uh, Freik. Um, Maurice, is that, hopefully that answers the question for Ralph. Uh, if not, uh, he can ask again, hashtag Ask Hotel on uh, the YouTube channel, uh, preferred on the Twitter channel. Uh, hashtag Ask Wartel. Yes, it's on your background, also on my background. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have another question? Uh, no, at the moment now. Okay, um, then we will move forward. Um, Freik, you already mentioned, um, I think it was you, uh, regarding use cases, um, regard, no, it was Marcel. <laughs> Use cases around uh, GPU intensive uh, applications. Um, what are what about using that GPUs? Um, how common is it, and what do we benefit from that? Yeah, yeah, great question. And I think that um, uh, if you take a look at um, leveraging a GPU, uh, most often uh, we think about scenarios that are based on uh, CAD applications and uh, design applications and really heavy design applications that really require a GPU and most often do not even launch without uh, not having a GPU uh, available. So if we take a look at the, uh, the screen right now, these are just a couple of examples of uh, application types that you might be uh, what you might be thinking about. So design applications, CAD CAM applications, uh, like we said. That's the most common scenario that many people think about when they are talking about uh, leveraging a GPU. However, there are many other types of applications that also can leverage and can benefit from a GPU. Uh, even the quote unquote simple applications like your office applications, your operating system, and also your browsers uh, leverage from a GPU. So without not many people uh, knowing this, they also leverage from a GPU and are able to offload some of that CPU uh, to get a better uh, performance. So it's interesting to see when, when you're talking about migrating a existing application landscape that's currently on-premises and uh, want to migrate that to Windows Virtual Desktop, that at that point, we still have discussion on whether or not to use a GPU. 
which is interesting because all of the devices that they're currently running uh, and using, they have a GPU. So why is there a discussion? Uh, in fact, if you would go to uh, an average uh, hardware store, computer hardware store, try to order a laptop that does not contain a GPU, a recent laptop, you'll probably fail because they don't exist anymore. It's common technology to have a GPU on board. So the reason why there's still a lot of uh, discussion when you have that same workload and you migrate that to the Azure, uh, to Azure based on Windows Virtual Desktop, for example, but this applies to other technologies based on, on cloud technology as well, um, is the cost, right? So in the past, we only had a single virtual machine type that uh, contained a GPU, the NV series uh, VM that contains an M60 GPU based on uh, the NVIDIA chipset. Uh, which is a really powerful machine, uh, but also, of course, in terms of cost, a pretty expensive uh, machine. So if you have like 20 uh, of those machines running 24-7, uh, you will get a big Azure bill at the end of the month. Uh, so, of course, you can do um, automation and auto-scaling on top of that to make sure that you shut down and deallocate virtual machines that you're not using. But still, these are quite heavy uh, machines. So uh, in the meantime, we also have other uh, VM types available uh, that we have on screen right now, the NV series, uh, AS series VMs, which contain a AMD uh, GPU. Uh, and the interesting thing is that some of these machine tires do not create a full GPU or multiple GPUs, but only a fraction of a GPU. Uh, and that makes them ideal workloads for those applications that are not in the category of full heavy design applications. Uh, but st can still le uh, leverage and benefit that GPU in order to get a better uh, performance. It's also interesting to see that the prices of these VMs, uh, comparing it to the NV series, uh, the really heavy machines, are not that much more expensive than regular DS series uh, VMs, which are common to use for Windows Virtual Desktop today as well. So I can really encourage uh, everyone to take a look at those VM types and test your application landscape and your uh, use cases to see if you can also benefit from those series uh, as well. So to give you a little demo on uh, what it means to have a GPU on board inside Windows Virtual Desktop, we're going to roll uh, this uh, demo video right here. And as you can see, I'm running two virtual machines, both on Windows Virtual Desktop, and one of them uh, does contain a GPU and the other one doesn't. So I probably do not have to explain which of these VMs uh, does have the GPU uh, on board. You can clearly tell the difference in terms of the perceived end user experience that the one on the right uh, is using a GPU and the one on the left uh, is not. So it's a clear difference in, uh, in this DirectX uh, application that we use as the sample. The second one is, uh, is the fishbowl. And this is an HTML5 application, interactive application, uh, showing us a couple of fish inside uh, a fishbowl. So right now we're using 10 fish which uh, both machines can handle uh, pretty good, not that much experience uh, in difference. But once we move to 100 fish in both of these bowls, we can now already see the difference between using a GPU on the right side with 60 frames per second and 46 frames per second on the left-hand side. Uh, and if we push that even further, let's go to 1,000 fish in a bowl. You probably don't fit in real life, but just for the sake of this demo, let's do that. We can see the difference between these, right? So on the left-hand side, it looks more like, uh, well, a dead fish, I would say. And on the right-hand side, we have 1,000 uh, fish. And we can even go to a 2,000 fish, 2,000 objects that are rendered inside this session based on Windows Virtual Desktop. So to show you some of the power of that, uh, of that virtual machine as an example uh, application. And the last one I'll show you is the car visualizer. So this allows you to take a look at a, uh, a car, which has uh, lights and shadows at, uh, projected uh, on it, and also moves the camera around. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it moves pretty smooth. And on the left-hand side, it is, uh, it is still. So we can also use our mouse to uh, look at it at different angles and interact with this application uh, versus on uh, the left-hand side, where it really starts to, uh, starts to start. So just to give you an example of what's, uh, what's possible, leveraging a GPU inside uh, a virtual machine to get a uh, better performance for your, your graphic workloads, uh, so to speak. So that's awesome, uh, Freik. Uh, maybe you have one uh, or two other demos, uh, because I have uh, seen some social posts from you uh, with some fun scenarios. Um, what is that? And maybe you can show us uh, one or two, uh, two demos on that. 
Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, to show you those demos. So thank you for asking. So I have a couple of uh, ones that are more in, like you said, the, the fun uh, category. So yes, we can leverage Windows Virtual Desktop for our production application and design applications, uh, stuff like that. But what about gaming inside Windows Virtual Desktop? So the first one I want to show you is uh, Command and Conquer. If you are familiar with this game, this was uh, first introduced in 1995 and has been currently <laughs> remastered into a new version, which is available uh, in my virtual machine right now. So this is the remastered version with better uh, quality of uh, graphics and audio, uh, et cetera. So as you can see, a pretty fluent uh, experience. And if you are familiar with this game, if you used to play this, I used to play this back in 1995, you will probably recognize uh, the graphics that you're about to see in just uh, a second as we open up uh, the gameplay from within a virtual machine hosted, uh, hosted in Azure. So let's launch that game. And as you can see, if you are familiar with the game, again, you probably recognize this scenario. Uh, you're moving your troops and your armies uh, to, uh, to start a battle with, uh, with your enemy or with your, components, with your opponents to be able to, uh, to play this game. And it runs pretty smooth. So uh, if the, good, the experience is good. The audio is also redirected, which we currently don't hear. But yes, it's there. Uh, and it runs uh, pretty smooth. So this is running from within the Windows Virtual Desktop client, the Windows client. Uh, but we can also leverage the same uh, web client, the browser-based client for this game uh, as well. So we're switching to that demo right now. This is a web browser running on my local machine. I'm connecting towards Windows Virtual Desktop and opening up that same virtual machine with the same workload providing our username and password, logging on, and we now have the game running inside of our local browser. So this was obviously one of the more fun uh, demos you could think of uh, and prepare, uh, which really shows uh, the power of, uh, of the Azure Cloud. So uh, you mentioned a couple of demos, so I will, uh, I will stick to that. So I have a second demo to show you, uh, which is more of a graphic-intensive uh, application. So yes, Command & Conquer is using a GPU, it's leveraging it, uh, but what about a more a 3D application or 3D game, I would say, in terms of Flight Simulator? So if you are familiar with that game, it is obviously a game that has been there for many years uh, as well, which was recently being reintroduced as uh, the 2020 uh, release of this game. Uh, we're now running it inside the virtual machine as part of Windows Virtual Desktop. So as we wait for this, uh, this uh, intro to finish, you can also see some of the, uh, the graphics that are playing right now. It was actually quite interesting, and here are some of the graphics uh, right now, quite interesting to also install this game, uh, because apparently this game re requires a lot of uh, not only consumption in terms of GPU, but also storage. So I ended up using a, a default OS disk, which is only 127 uh, gigabytes, or well, only, it's a pretty big uh, disk, but the game didn't fit in there. So I first had to expand that operating system disk before I was even able to install the game. So we're running the game right now. Mostly we did fast forward this a little bit uh, because the loading of the game still takes uh, a couple of uh, minutes to complete, even on a, such a powerful uh, machine. Uh, but we're looking at the Schiphol Airport uh, right now. So we're about to take off and we'll see some of the, all of the graphics uh, of the game uh, right now. And uh, we're about to take off and see some of the, uh, some of the scenario surroundings of uh, the Schiphol Airport and of, uh, of Amsterdam. So let's wait for, uh, for this airplane to, uh, to fly off. And uh, we are in, um, in a couple of seconds inside, uh, well, actually behind the airport, uh, ready to take, uh, to take off. So I myself, I am not an experienced uh, pilot, uh, not in real life and not in this game uh, even. So I'll actually have my, uh, my co-pilot control the game and, uh, and do our, uh, our takeoff uh, from the airport. <laughs> so we're going to open up a couple of... Um, uh, statistics right here to see that it actually is leveraging the GPU. So we have uh, the GPUs. In this case, we're, we're using the NV24 machine, which contains 24 CPUs and four dedicated GPUs uh, as well. As we take off uh, from the Schiphol Airport, uh, we also have some telemetry data uh, on screen as well in terms of bandwidth, in terms of frames uh, per second uh, as well. So you might notice that it's not really a full fluent uh, experience. This was one of the first releases of the 2020 uh, game. In the meantime, we have seen updates for both the game as well as for the NVIDIA drivers, as well as for the operating system, which uh, allow you to push uh, that frames per second uh, even further. So we are going to uh, still on my to-do list to create another video uh, of that experience using uh, all, of those, uh, all of those updates. But well, what do you think, uh, Franz? Was that fun to see or what are your thoughts? I think 
I think it's really fun uh, to see that sort of uh, applications, games, uh, being in a Windows virtual desktop. And um, I think it shows uh, to the audience that um, highly GPU intensive applications like games uh, can be used uh, within an organization. Uh, if we look, if, if we look in, uh, at Autodesk, uh, uh, AutoCAD, uh, for example, with a with its uh, highly GPU intensive application, uh, if this this is working uh, with uh, all the requirements that are needed for flight sim, for example, uh, then that sort of applications can also be used. And I think uh, it's it's good to see. Uh, it's fun, but it, I think that the behind background um, is is more. Um, to understand um, that it can be used. Yep. Okay. Sure. Uh, thank you. Do you have another, or um, I think we have ten minutes left. Uh, maybe we uh, hide on. Yeah. There's one thing I want to share is that uh, we also have uh, a link uh, which is on our uh, deck right now, pointing to other videos in this category uh, as well. It should be on screen uh, now, showing the uh, the link and the QR code towards uh, the channel where we're. Uh, using uh, these games and other games uh, as well. There are much longer videos as well if you're interested in some of these results. And even the one that we didn't able, we're not able to show you today is uh, the Minecraft scenario. I can definitely encourage you to uh, to check that out because it uh, it's not what you think it is. So uh, I'll leave it at that, but uh, be sure to check that out. Yeah, I've seen that it's really interesting uh, to see what you have done uh, within Minecraft. And um, I think also the, the link to uh, the channel will also be posted later on into the, the session details uh, in, in the YouTube channel. Um, Maurice, um, do we have other questions uh, probably regarding uh, the things that uh, Freik has shown us? Uh, well, it's a question about uh, security. Uh, a question about security came in. Uh also uh, again uh this one is uh about uh, ca can we uh utilize uh azure sentinel to monitor uh, windows virtual desktop marcel is that something you can answer uh i don't have the experience actually on that uh i don't see why not but that's yeah, i can uh, i can comment on that if you want so uh, yes, so the, the short answer is definitely yes. Uh, uh, so Azure Sentinel is a support. There is guidance on, on leveraging that for Windows Virtual Desktop uh, as well. Uh, but besides that, we're also looking forward to have, uh, I think we also touched on that briefly before, is having the same capabilities that we're using on the physical de devices right now for Windows 10 Enterprise to have all of those features available in Windows Virtual Desktop uh, as well. So yes, we're using Windows 10 in there, but it's based on the multi-session uh, operating system, so multiple users on the same uh, virtual machine, which is not quite similar. So uh, we're still waiting for uh, uh, additional features to be added to use uh, all of these features that you have on the Enterprise Edition, uh, like the man we talked about uh, before, to have to come uh, to have those come to the uh, multi-user operating system uh, as well. So. Microsoft is definitely working on that to have a full uh, feature parity uh, between uh, those two uh, environments. So the physical one, single user, as well as the multi-user inside uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Yeah, thank you, Freik, for that uh, for that answer. Um, Maurice, um, any other questions? No, at the moment there isn't any other. No, sorry, people, come on, send those questions oh, using can... Twitter. Hashtag ask for tell. Come on, join the fun. Goodies. Yeah. <laughs> if necessary, if we can do it and we will answer all that questions. Um, I think we have two items to cover uh, in the next uh, few minutes. Um, oh, we got another question one is regarding yes. the Surface Duo. Uh, Microsoft uh, has that uh, launched, uh, I think, a month ago of, or so. Um, can we use that Surface Duo uh, together with a WVD, uh, Marcel? Yes, definitely. Uh, it's a really interesting device. Um, I've been waiting for a device like this for several years. Actually, Microsoft was already mentioning that it was going to release a device that was uh, into the mobile, mobile environment with a, a totally different form factor. And I think it's here now. Um, very often I just use my phone and this is actually comes close to a phone. Um, but if you look at it, um, 
Yeah, it's it's really uh, it, it is the, almost the size of a phone, but you can uh, uh, just fold it open, and it's really really strong device. It it's running on Android. I show you a quick quick movie, and then uh, we'll continue on on what the the use cases can be, in my opinion. So as you can see, uh, it has a dual screen. It folds open, and it's now connecting actually with the uh, Android client for WVD, and it's connecting similar to a normal machine. Uh, you can run applications uh, directly from the full desktop, uh, and it's responding similar to uh, your normal laptop or your normal device. So it's really, really strong capabilities of that. And uh, looking at this, this is some other use cases. So as you can see on the left, uh, it's just the device itself. It, it's folded open, and if you uh, use it like this, uh, actually the, the the horizontal part uh, moves into uh, sort of a keyboard or a taskbar option, and uh, makes it possible to to type or to to run applications from it that are shown on a vertical screen. And if you look to the bigger picture on the right, you see it actually hooked up to a a full blown monitor, and uh, just on a USB C cable. And it's it's yeah it's acting like a full blown Windows machine and it's really really powerful to, to use like that and definitely uh, in the background uh, the uh, if we recall the demos that Frey gave us uh, yeah this is definitely a device it's it's well it's not cheap of course at this point but uh, just looking at the form factor I expect that uh, similar devices will pop up in in the next. Uh, uh, 18 months or something like that, or 24 months, and similar use cases can be done just from a phone, basically. And that's what I've been thinking for the past years. That in the end, we probably just walk around with our phones, hook it up to uh, a docking station or even just a USB-C cable, and just connect it to a full-blown monitor and do our daily job on it. And that's really a strong case. Yeah, that reminds me. To something that call, that was called a continuum <laughs> a long time yeah, ago. Continuum. Yeah. Yes. Sure. But you... continuum. Yeah. Continuum at that point still needed an actual docking station. Um, it comes closer to what uh, Samsung with DX was already capable of, but still that was uh, a normal phone. And at that point, it was a phone that in the background with some technology had the possibility to show it or, or um, show itself as a full screen uh, solution. But this, on the other hand, the, the Duo, it is strong enough to use as a separate device as well. So it, it's more than just a phone. It's, a, it's similar to a phone. It, it, you can carry it as a phone. Uh, it's only slightly bigger than the phones do, we are used to nowadays. But because of the, the duo the, the duo screen and the folding screen and the way it's built, um, yeah, it gives you a full full device just in your hand or, like I said, connected to, uh, to a normal desktop devices, desktop keyboard, desktop uh, printing, uh, et cetera, uh, into WVD. Uh, it makes it a really strong use case for a lot of environments, I, I expect. And we have the privilege uh, to, to to already to test with that devices uh, because um, they were ordered and delivered to, to, to us as the first partner in the in the Netherlands. Uh, I think Freik, you have them there. I do actually. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is the device, and uh, I actually uh, well went to the office uh, today to to pick it up for this uh, demo specifically. But as you can see, as Marcel mentioned, it is a really uh, it's a small device. It's, it's a little bit larger than a large uh, iPhone, I would say. But uh, the, the good thing, obviously, is uh, is opening it up and having uh, that dual screen uh, available. So let me just quickly um, log on to this uh, device here. And as you can see, we can now see uh, the capabilities of the device. So on the left hand side, I have uh, my apps available. Uh, just like on any other uh, phone, but on the right hand side, we also have uh, the Windows Virtual Desktop client and it actually opens already up. So, you know, without me having to log on, it is available uh, right here. So I can interact with that. I can go uh, to the start menu 
and start using it as if it were uh, my, uh, my Windows client. So similarly, what I could do is uh, open up that simple or the same application we had before with the, uh, the DirectX application, but this time running on side of a, inside of a Surface uh, Duo uh, based on the virtual machine in Azure, uh, leveraging that same GPU technology we talked about uh, before. So a really small device, and I think a really powerful device, and I might just actually keep it, so don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a great device. I've already uh, had it in my hands, and uh, when I did, when I put it in the pocket, it's more or less the same size as other for other phones. So I, I think I, it will be a device that, uh, that that come later on with great features. Yeah, thank you to share for showing us that. Uh, we have one topic left for uh, this evening because um, we are in the in the notes. Uh, we are we were saying that we discuss the new features from uh, Ignite. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I think, uh, Freek, uh, maybe you can cover uh, some cool new features that were coming to WVD in, in the next few months. Yeah, yeah, so, so we just had uh, the Ignite conference, uh, like you said, and unfortunately, we could not be there in person uh, uh, due to the whole, uh, well, the whole COVID situation, uh, obviously. Uh, but they did host it fully uh, virtual uh, this year, which was the first time for this uh, for this huge uh, and, uh, event as well. I think they did a great job uh, hosting that fully virtual for uh, really a much bigger audience than uh, well, in the past, uh, of course. So we did make a, a list of the um, features that are coming for Windows Virtual Desktop uh, specifically uh, that were announced uh, during uh, Ignite. So. One of the great things is that we now are uh, we now have the capability to use that uh, that mem the support we talked about, so the Microsoft Endpoint uh, Manager support. Uh, do know that this is the announcement was made for Windows 10 single user, so they did not announce the multi user uh, support yet that is coming. Uh, but this is for the, the single user support, which is uh, which is available. Another thing is is MSAX App Attack. So we did see a great demo on how to um, uh, add an application and attach an application to a running machine without installing an application using that MSAX app attacks technology. Uh, but that demo was based on PowerShell scripts, right? Because, uh, well, for the sake of the demo, we showed that to be able to uh, simulate what was going on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, but what they did announce is the uh, integration of MSAX app attach inside the Azure portal. So uh, you will simply go to the Azure portal, and add your MSAX applications uh, there, and the whole uh, mounting and staging uh, and all those processes will be handled for you uh, well, just by adding those to, uh, to the Azure portal or using your automation uh, ARM template uh, for that. New integration with Azure Monitor that is already uh, available right now. So you can use uh, uh, Azure Monitoring and Log Analytics to get great insights about your environment. So telemetry data about the virtual machines, but also about the usage. So who logged on to the environment, how long did the logon process take, what are, uh, well, the average number of users and which applications that they launch to get good details about the insights about the uh, health of your WVD uh, environment. Another thing is direct uh, support for uh, your RDP session. So right now, the WVD client is not using the MSTSC client on board on your Windows uh, machine in that case, but it's using the Windows Virtual Desktop client, which uh, is currently RDP TCP only. What they announced is a first step to also support UDP protocols. Uh, and for this first step, it means that you will need to have a direct connection between the virtual machine uh, and the end user, uh, most likely based on, uh, on Express Route or site to site uh, VPNs to have that UDP support available. And as next upcoming steps, they will also add UDP support for other clients and other scenarios uh, as well. Another great thing is uh, start VM on session launch, which means that. Uh, if you have a uh, one-to-one -one relationship with your virtual machine and your virtual machine is um, turned off as part of your auto-scaling and auto-sizing um, configuration, um, that VM will not open if the user clicks on the icon inside his Windows Virtual Desktop client. So with this capability, once the user clicks on that client, the virtual machine that he has access to at that point will be launched in order for that for him to, uh, to log on to that virtual machine. So, that provides you both with the, scale, with the scaling capabilities to save costs, as well as the user allowing uh, allowing the user to start his own virtual machine uh, for that for that matter. And the last thing is about security. We did uh, had a couple of security questions, so this is definitely a hot uh, topic. This allows you to disable uh, screen capture from remote apps and from remote desktops 
uh, from within the, the Windows Virtual your desktop uh, client. So you're able to have uh, your security uh, properties in place to disable uh, users uh, trying to capture screenshots from their remoting sessions uh, to get an even better security for your WD uh, environment. So a couple of highlights uh, on what was uh, announced uh, at Ignite. And uh, yeah, many of these features are going to come out later this year. So looking forward to, uh, looking forward to those being available uh, to all of us. Yeah, what a great list of, uh, of new features uh, that are coming. Marcel, what's, what's your favorite on that list? Uh, the Start VM on Session Launch. That's really, really helping a lot of customers to, to, to lower their compute cost on one-to-one -one, uh, machines because it doesn't have to be turned on, as Freik uh, uh, described, uh, all the time. So you can turn it off uh, automatically, auto shutdown, or by scaling. And it is still available for at the moment it's needed within several seconds after uh, clicking on it in the WVD client. So that's a really good feature, and I look forward to, the, to that. Yeah. Great. Uh, Freik, what's, what's your favorite? Uh, I think my favorite would be the MSAX uh, app portal uh, integration. Uh, we've been a part of many of the uh, technical previews of MSAX app attach uh, in one of the earlier previews uh, as well. Uh, we already noticed that it's a really powerful technology allowing you to extract those applications from the operating system to extend your image management and all of the, uh, all of the application uh, challenges we have. So I'm definitely looking forward to have that integrated in the Azure portal and allowing you to use that using uh, your ARM templates and your automation. So yeah, one definitely I'm looking forward to, to seeing. So what about you, Franz? What do you think? Uh, I think I go with you with the uh, MSC, uh, MSCX app attach uh, because I, I had the same as you. I, uh, I had the privilege to be one of the first to play with it. And uh, what we see with that is that it's going very, uh, to be very helpful in uh, making applications available. Um, instantly to users if they need it without installing applications into the uh, core or uh, core os uh, and with that um, in time the users can be more productive uh, in on on that machines and i think uh, that will be uh, very helpful yeah for sure. okay thank you uh, all um maurice do we have uh, some last question in the um, in the social channels yeah, I've got uh, one uh, last question uh, for you guys. Uh, this one comes from Adrian Mutswiti. Uh, he asks if uh, we can use uh, Lighthouse to manage uh, Windows Virtual Desktop uh, at our clients, uh, our customers. Yeah, so Azure, Azure Lighthouse customers, can they use a Windows Virtual Desktop? Um, Marcel Freik, uh, who can answer uh, that question? Yeah, I can take that one. It's, it's uh, not to the full extent as you would expect from uh, other Lighthouse uh, um, capabilities for other products inside the Azure. So it is there, but not fully yet. So we're still waiting. We are also waiting for that to be uh, to be fully available in the Azure portal. But great question, Neil. Yeah, yeah, good, uh, good to, uh, thanks for that answer. And hopefully uh, that, that's enough for, uh, for Adrian. Uh, otherwise he can ping us uh, later on uh, after the show uh, also, and we can discuss that with him. Um, so, um, do we have any other questions, Maurice? Open? No. Too bad. Then, will we, uh, then we will be close this uh, this live stream. We have discussed Windows Photo Desktop and uh, the notes from the field that we cover. Uh, we've seen how we can automate deployments um, of Windows Photo Desktop. We've discussed the new announcement. Uh, Freik uh, and Marcel, thank you for having you in, uh, in the show and uh, giving us the insights. Yeah, our pleasure. Very Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, friends. And guys, uh, if you like this video, uh, please uh, hit like and uh, maybe consider to subscribe to our channel and hit that bell button to get notified about uh, new videos. And that's a good addition, uh, Maurice. And uh, you know, in about two weeks, we will host another live stream about Azure Sentinel. So please keep an eye on our social channels uh, to be informed about the new live stream uh, that, will, that is coming. So thanks for now. And I say until the next time, bye-bye.